Welcome to the Geek Geek Podcast, where sometimes stories come to an end, but not ours, not today. Don't worry about that part. Uh, I'm Void, and I'm here with my co-host, Bij. I never even thought about that. Yeah, no. Like saying the endings, like we're not going anywhere. No, we want to talk about story endings because this year there are so many big ones. Like um, the reason that you fleshed out most of the show notes here, which usually this is the other way around. I'm the one who like records stuff during the week. I had kind of the idea because um, Game of Thrones is coming to an end. You know, Avengers Endgame is here. We just talked about that. Star Wars Episode Nine is going to happen this year, you know, within the 2019 year. And that's a huge ending for the Skywalker saga. And oh, yeah. like you and I started talking about it. There are other things too that are probably not as big as those three. Those are the three that made me come up with the idea. But like I was even thinking, you know, War of the Spark, even though I've been into magic for like three weeks now. But people are telling me they're like, this is a weird place to jump in because this is the end of this epic storyline that's been going on for years. And you said like Crazy Ex Girlfriend too, right? Yeah, I uh, Crazy Ex Girlfriend just finished up its fourth season, and that has become very quickly over the past year mine and Jennifer's favorite show. That it's it's comfort food basically, where we sit on the couch when we don't have anything else to do, and so it ended. And so now we're in that place where we were with other comfort shows, where now we just get to watch old stuff, just like you know going back to watch Game of Thrones or all of the MCU movies with this. Like there is now a complete story to go back through and nitpick. And, and to really see what we've missed. I shouldn't even say nitpick, but uh, just go and scrutinize and find what other joy we can. Yeah, and it's just interesting because, like, some of these are, they're big, not that they, well, some of them are just big because they're, like, such a huge story, you know? Like, yeah. Game of Thrones has, like, all these years of weight behind it. Actually, all of these do, don't they? Like, Star Wars, Game of Thrones, um, and Avengers, like, they all have a long history behind them. But because of that, they have these, like, mass fandoms associated with them, too, right? Anything that goes on that long is going to have a fan base that goes beyond just cult, where if something ends quickly, it generally has a cult following. But if something like these, like Star Wars and Game of Thrones and Avengers, like they went straight up mainstream. And when something like that ends, that's when it gets really, really popular. And uh, well, that's when it gets really, really interesting to see how they end it. Like I think Supernatural is ending this year too. Wow. Like if it's not this year, it's, it starts its last season this year and finishes up next spring. So technically it's ending, you know, this year too. And not all of them are even like a, a hard ending of the entire like series or the entire universe or whatever. Like Game of Thrones, HBO is already working on prequels and who knows if they'll have like a sequel. But they've been talking about like, oh, yeah, we'll have prequel. Like, I'm sure they're just desperate to find something else that's ever going to do as well as Game of Thrones did. And Star Wars is like the whole saga, you know, the whole Skywalker saga that so many people have been invested in. And like Star Wars will go on beyond this. But it'll be different. It'll be a different story, a different saga, probably a different part of the universe. And it's going to be so weird to see how they do that. Because right now, everything that they've done, except for the Old Republic stuff in the old Star Wars, has been tied around this overall narrative in some way that it ties in with the empire or it ties in with with individual characters and what led them here or it's very rarely full periphery without it really touching on anything else uh, in terms of the skywalker saga and this is going to be the first time with some of these uh like the ryan johnson trilogy that we may get stuff that has nothing to do with this yeah, I mean, that's kind of what they've been hinting at, like that this is probably the end for this like main saga that people have been following since the 70s. It'll be huge. And like the MCU, you know, um, the next movie finishes out phase three, phase four. Which phase are we in right now? Phase We're three? We're in phase three right now, I think. Okay. So, so, so Far From Home finishes that up and we move into phase four. Right. So uh, Far From Home, they've said, is kind of like the epilogue to uh, Avengers Endgame. So I'll, that's all that I'll say because this is not a spoiler episode and I know a lot of people haven't seen them yet. Um, but just to like calibrate everyone's expectations, they came out and they said that, that, you know, yep. Far From Home is not the start of the next thing. It's like the epilogue of the current thing. And yeah, where Ant-Man was like that on the last one, where it just had little things that it needed to wrap up before or the uh, the next one could happen. Yeah, but there's just like there's so much in these endings because people are so invested. So we kind of want to talk about like 
what makes a good ending and what makes a bad ending. And you are way more qualified than I am to talk about this. But I can tell you the one thing that sticks out to me as a bad ending is when it's predictable. Right. Like that will just uh, throw me off and make me hate something. Yeah, it's predictability actually doesn't bother me that much if what's predicted isn't something that's garbage i mean i don't know if that makes any kind of sense like if i can see where they're going from a while out i don't necessarily consider that a bad ending it's it can sometimes be a good use of foreshadowing and a good use of telegraphing so that the audience isn't confused and maybe people who who are invested in it know uh, know that stuff enough to be able to to predict it but it's one of those things where if it's predictable and it follows that same formula as say other stuff in that genre that's when i have a problem with it maybe that's what i meant that's probably a better way to say it like if if I've seen this story before, right? If it's like, oh, this right. is a rehash of something I've seen a million times already, I'm not as interested in that. But I guess if I can see it coming, which most of the time I can see the ending of a story way before it's going to happen, that part doesn't bother me as long as it's a unique take on it. Right, because I think Endgame is a good example of that. And I'm not even going to say anything here, so don't worry all about spoilers. But there were things going in that I said, this is probably going to happen. I expect this to happen. And they did. Like, that was just what happened in the movie. And uh, based on things that that I just predicted and and knew about the uh, the the MCU and business in general. And so it was... That was predictable to me, but I didn't ever feel like, even though I was like expecting, but like, yep, there it is. It was a, it was still a surprise because of the way it was put through the narrative itself. And I hate cliches. Like it was all a dream, that kind of thing. That's actually my least favorite ending of all. That is one where I I'm just like the writers phoned it in, where the uh, the it was all a dream. Like somebody woke up, or uh, you know, it was a fantasy or something like that like uh, it turns out that maybe they were just daydreaming the whole time and that was what they wanted or like the end of Roseanne where uh, the whole last season was nothing Dan had died and she had uh, written her novel about it uh, written a novel about her life if he had not died uh, and then you find out at the very end of the season that that's what it was it's like that's a cop out that that makes it where you don't want to have any kind of resolution for these characters and makes it so that that I don't even know what uh, what it makes it. I don't even know how to say how cheap it makes it. It pulls all emotion out of it because none of that actually happened within that world. Yeah, I can totally see that. Like, I think I think those cliches throw me off too. But right. the the other side of it is what makes a good ending for something and so. I don't even know. This is like, where I'm curious about with you because right. you say I'm more qualified for this, but I'm actually far less picky about stuff. Like all of the things, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, I know as we get down the notes, but I tend to uh, like endings that other people despise. So I'm really curious for you what makes a good ending. Like predictability and cliches are are you know all fine and dandy to uh to finish it out with a bad one but if you see it like what makes it what makes it good for you i think if it either has payoff that is well earned like it's a deserved payoff for whatever story they're telling and i know that's very broad strokes but i feel right. like it's true like gut instinct tells me that's right and then the other thing is if it makes me think like if I leave uh, a show or a movie or a book or whatever and I keep thinking about it, that's pretty rare. Like I don't yeah. I don't know. I absorb content really fast and then I move on to the next thing. So if I'm still like caught up on something like days or weeks later, that's a really good sign to me that it was a good ending because it like it engaged my brain in a way that I wasn't expecting and it like really made me put some effort into it. And that's really that's kind of one of the things that as as we were moving into this that I wrote down at the bottom of of our good ending section like ineffability, huh? And it's like there's this ineffable quality. There's something about it that you can't quite put your finger on that makes you walk out of the theater and just go, huh? 
And I've said that before, but that makes the best ending for me if I don't know what to think about it and I have to start thinking about it. Like if a movie, if I walk out of a movie and just, just like you said, if it's something that's unmemorable, if it's something that I have to, that I've experienced and I move on with my life and don't think about it anymore, it's not necessarily that it's bad. It's just not good. It's not something that I'm... I would necessarily consider art and I sound like like terrible saying that I hate being that guy who says that but it's there is something there that a good ending is an art and most people cannot do that yeah that's a really good point I mean you have a bunch of notes in here about like things that can contribute to it is it worth touching on or is it better to leave it kind of like what we just said where it's kind of there's a little bit of an unknown quality to it. Well, I do want to say that there are a couple of things that we tend to look for that that end up making it so that if that doesn't happen, that uh, that it's really interesting on how we approach the uh, the ending itself. Like you know what I put on here, just plot, but like I meant something along the lines of does it actually wrap things up? Does that ending hit on individual subplots or does it leave stuff just out in the air or ignore things that it brought up and never address them again? Because that can be frustrating, but like Endgame ended up doing a lot of wrapping up. So that's a, I felt that was a very good thing on it. The same goes for the characters. Like you said, things have to feel emotionally earned, but the, the three big ones to me are are things like when a twist happens whether it's a good twist or a bad twist like you have like old M. Night Shyamalan movies where a lot of times those were good twists you have things like Black Mirror and The Twilight Zone where there's always a twist to them like you know there's going to be a twist going in and the fun of the ending is what kind of twist it is it's like you know that, that you're watching something and it is completely not what you're seeing like you are watching something from the wrong perspective and then a lot of times you have to watch it a second time to make sure to see how they led up to it to know whether or not that was a good twist or not um same for that kind of revelation right there that you'll get at the end like you get that that like almost 11th hour kind of of savior where it can either be something that is really really fantastic and brought in and there's a revelation that makes that brings everything together or it could be deus ex machina where they pull it out from nowhere and it's like where did that even come from and makes no sense so that's one that can make a really good ending or a really bad one, uh, depending <laughs> on how somebody approaches the idea of revelation. I mean, without going too far into the whole uh, English teachery part about uh, it being a revelation and it being deus ex machina with uh, God in the machine or God from the machine and all of this, it's uh, but it, I mean, that's what it is. That kind of revelation at the end can be uh, very opening and very, very fulfilling if some new information comes at the end uh, but it can also be a terrible letdown um, probably my favorite endings and they're the ones everyone hates but I love them are the cliffhangers like how do you feel about cliffhanger endings they're okay and, it and depends I'm, on how they're done like I there have been some that I really like and there are some that I'm like okay that was a cheap cop out no I don't, I don't appreciate that Okay, so how do you feel? Okay, so there are two kind of cliffhangers in my mind. There are are cliffhangers that are used as transitions between something, between chapters, between episodes, or between movies, and then there are cliffhangers that completely end the narrative. There, like that is where they end it with the idea of something else coming, but you don't know what it is. Uh, but something like the Sopranos ending, which I'm sure that you guys have have heard about, even if you haven't seen, where it ends on a cliff. Cliffhanger. After all of this, you get no actual resolution to this one particular main thread. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Um, I think a lot of the time, if it's ambiguous, it can be done really well. But also sometimes I get the impression that somebody leaves, like the creator, the writer, the director, whatever it is, will leave a, an ambiguous ending when they just don't know how to end it. So that's the difference. Is like if it that's feels true. like it was purposeful and it was always meant to be that way right from the beginning of when they started like writing or creating or whatever, I'm okay with it. And you can kind of tell. I mean, it's a gut instinct thing. There's no like hard and fast rule around it. But there are some that it feels like, Oh, they wanted to leave you right there so that you have to fill in the next step. And there are right. some that it ends and you go, 
what? Like, no, that's not fair. Like, you didn't know what to do. You gave up. Like, you gave up on this story. So that's kind of the difference that I see. <laughs> that's very true. Like, that's a really good way of putting it. Like, I didn't even, like, I couldn't have phrased it that way. But but you're absolutely right. Because, like, the Sopranos ending, it feels like it was crafted. Like, Inception feels like it was crafted. Uh, where you don't know what happens, but there is enough. There's enough around it. To, around it yeah i can't yeah. even think of the, what what it is around it like i was trying to think of that word like there there's enough uh information that you've had from the rest of the movie to make an assumption and that lets you have the ending that you need as opposed to having an ending from a director yeah and ones like that i like a lot i appreciate those it's the ones that just come out of nowhere and they don't feel like they were leading up to it or like they were thinking about it ahead of time that just they gave up. Those are the ones that'll bother yeah. me. How do you feel about endings? Like one of the okay, so Stephen King says he's bad at endings. Like Stephen King is bad at endings. Like any Stephen King book that you read, way stronger until like the last like tenth of it. It is going to go downhill, and it's like, well, that was a Stephen King ending, and so. Some people watch these long TV shows like Game of Thrones or watch Avengers Endgame, and they've seen the, this 20, 22 movie series, and they look at the ending, and if it's not exactly what they wanted or expected out of that, they have this feeling that that ruins the entire work. Like that is, or reading a book even, it's like, well, I wasted the last 300 pages. I wasted the last thousand pages. Like... Do you feel like the endings of a story or any of this these serial narratives or even a video game that that devalues the rest of the work if they don't stick the landing? Um, I think it can. It depends on the circumstance because if it's so if it's like a standalone novel or if it's a movie and it's only two hours, right, or like two and a half, whatever. Right. Um, it's. If it has a bad ending, I definitely think it detracts from the overall work. You know, if it's something where they've obviously been leading up to it and they have all of these things that, like, they've made kind of these, like, promises to the viewer, the listener, the reader, whatever, that they are going to wrap up these things and they don't wrap it up, that can make the whole work overall worse. But if it's something where it's super long form because there are so many movies in a series or there are so many TV shows or so many books even though that one is debatable um it i don't feel like if the ending is bad it doesn't mean the whole show is bad especially a lot of tv shows i guess that's kind of where my mind keeps going you know right. um, a lot of tv shows are made in a way that every episode is not completely self-contained but more self-contained than a lot of other mediums are um so that changes things but yeah like does that kind of make sense? It really depends on the it length does. of it and like the promises that the creator has set up. I think I'm a little less picky than you are on this. I think this is where my uh, my liking dumb stuff and kind of having bad taste comes in because I don't really ever feel like the very end, like the actual conclusion of a of a story changes the way if I how I felt about the rest of it like a bad ending rather if they end it poorly and I don't like the ending if there was something in the beginning or I liked everything that led up to it I don't feel like that ruined the like first hour and a half of the movie if the last you know 45 minutes were just a hot mess and didn't make any sense I feel like as a movie itself it could have done better but I never feel like it ruined like I may watch that part of the movie again I may just not watch the ending and uh like the dark tower series have you read it no i mean i read a book or two but i never read the whole thing okay so so i'm not going to spoil anything for people uh but when you get through it it is a seven book series and uh, they progressively get longer and more epic and it is one of my favorite fantasy series of all time like it is so so good and definitely worth your time um but there are two endings to this book that or this series really the last one is book seven called it's just called the dark tower so in the dark tower they get to the end and everything happens like you expect it to or well you know i don't even want to say like you expect it to because that's not necessarily it everything happens and what they have been leading up to uh in that particular book they reach that point and stephen king interjects a interjects with with like a a in a 
an aside, I think. I can't remember what he calls it, a detour maybe, uh, where Stephen King as an author comes in and says, if you are the kind of person who thinks the journey is more important than the ending, then I think you need to stop right here. This is where you're going to get the happiest ending you're going to get. This is where everything that you care about wraps up. This is the end of the story for you. Do not read beyond this because you are going to be sad uh, at the way that everything is written past this. And he said, if that's not you, then keep reading because this is the this is what happens next. This is the true ending of that story. And so you go through, you read another 50-ish to 100 pages, I think. I don't even honestly remember, but I know it's the last bit of the book. And you get the real ending of the book. It's uh, And it is absolutely a different feel, a different take, a completely different walk away ineffable. Huh. Uh, when you end from one point to the other. And uh, it is, I really, really appreciate him as an author saying, this is where you could, this is a good stopping point. I could have stopped here. You can stop here. And there's nothing wrong with you for that. Uh, but, but if you really care, keep reading. Like, I loved that because he understood how people take in narratives and consume them. That's that super just, interesting. It's, it's super cool. Like, it is. It's worth reading to get to that point, and uh, I can't actually quote my favorite part because it uh, it is not a clean rating part of it. Uh, it will not work for our podcast, but uh, there is a particular line in there that, that really, if you're a Stephen King fan, you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to read beyond this, uh, where, where you know what that is. And like, so like Lost. Did you watch Lost? I can't remember. This that is one, one that I, I forget who sees it. I watched a couple episodes once and then like I was on the sideline. So I was not part of that at all. Okay. So Lost is one of those shows that I will go to my grave defending that the ending to that show is great. And anybody who says differently i will fight on that because there is i'm not even i'm not going to spoil anything that's one thing that i'm not going to do in this one this is not a spoiler cast but the main issue people have with lost everybody says this is what happened i've knew it all along this is what it was the 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 writer said that wasn't what happened but i guessed it in season one this is what actually happened and there is a character in the season finale of Lost, the series finale of Lost, who specifically says that's not true. Like, there is a character in the show who tells another character what these people are saying about the show is not true. And it's like, you guys are not watching the show like you're watching shows. I know we all watch shows differently, but a character actually tells you specifically this isn't what happens. And then people are like, well, that's what happened. It, it's it. That one drives me nuts. But they say it ruined the entire show is my point. Like so many people say that it ended like this and it ruined all of it. And it's like, even if that one episode ruined every like didn't end the way if the that episode had ended the way they thought it did. How could that ruin the previous six seasons of it? The previous hundred and eight episodes or whatever it is like how do all of those get ruined because of that that one sentence yeah i mean i know that you have like i'm jumping ahead a couple on your list but battlestar galactica is on here too and that's one of those where i'm just thinking through like you know how something could ruin an entire series and i don't think the ending of battlestar ruins the entire series but there are definitely books and movies and shows that i've watched where um you get to the ending and it doesn't make you want to re-engage with it again and like reread it or rewatch uh, it or whatever. And I think that that might be the problem for some people because I can get that. If, I can understand that. Yeah. Like if you, if they want to set it up in a way that there's like so much more going on and you don't know as the viewer until the end, and then they don't give you that catharsis in the end to want to go back and, oh, now I have a different view on it. I can rewatch the entire thing and get something new out of it because I have this piece of information. Like, if it's missing that, um, I don't know. I think that that could be playing a part in Lost, just from what I know of, like, reading about Lost and around right. it. And, you know, I think that some endings, if they leave me with that feeling, it's just like, 
yeah, maybe I'll watch this again in the future, but it's going to be in like five or 10 years. Like, you know, right. it just, it pushes me away from like immediately diving in or rewatching or like trying to engage with it more. And I'm like, well, okay, I'll move on to the next thing. And that's one with Lost. Like it's, I will defend the ending of Lost every day, all day. I cannot defend the way that they led up to it because they had no idea what they were doing. Like there were, there were threads dropped. There were things that were ignored. There were stories that were told in weird ways that they had led up to and then just like went did a 180 like the storytelling was all over the place toward the end of the series but the ending was consistent and uh, that's one thing that bugs me and like fringe got canceled early fringe is one of my favorite tv shows that's ever existed like it's it is so so good and there are a lot of people who say that the final season of it is like ruined all of it and it's like, that's another thing. It's like, how does that devalue the original work? How does that devalue anything that you cared about before if you didn't like the uh, the way it all ended? It's that that one bugs me. The How I Met Your Mother thing, you know, the, the last season was not very good. The very end of it was not very good. But I can still go back and enjoy the stuff that led up to it. Like Battlestar Galactica is one that's like lost for me. Um, I know you've seen Battlestar, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. Without spoiling it for people who haven't, because you guys still absolutely need to watch it. I think it's wonderful and lovely, and everyone should experience that. Um, what did you think about the ending? Uh, I think it kind of dropped the ball. I think it could have did been really? way, way better, yeah. It wasn't, it didn't like ruin it for me, but like I mentioned, you know, it's one of them that. It was enough of a miss that it made me want to, like, not immediately dive in and, like, engage with that more, even though I felt like it could have been one where it was like, oh, I've learned something amazing. Now I need to go back and, like, rewatch stuff. It it definitely wasn't. It was the opposite of that. It was the opposite of that. That's one where I look at it's like, that's a fine ending. That was not a good ending. That was not the ending I wanted. It was an ending and it's not that it's bad and it doesn't ruin anything else that led up to it, but it feels like they were leading up to something that could have been greater and the storytellers didn't know how to get to it. And that's really the biggest disappointment to me is when the storytellers are great at the buildup and then the ending is for some reason completely out of their control. Like whether it's a uh, whether it's a network cutting them short or anything like that, it's like that's the the most disheartening thing is when you have this great story, but that final point you either end it too soon or too late. That's the hard part about endings. Like you can end it, and like Stephen King was like, this is an ending. This is where it could end, and he knew that, but he actually did a good ending on it. I thought and kept going a little further where a lot of storytellers don't get that don't find that range where they can be in. They try to either explain too much or uh, just do it which I think Battlestar Galactica did. I think they tried to explain too much. Well, there's also stuff like Firefly, you know, where it just right. you didn't get an ending and then when you finally got it, it was a movie, so it was rushed and weird and it was kind of a strange format compared to what had come before it you know it was an ending it was better than not having one probably but you know was it the way it should have been probably not and there are other shows that like um i'm thinking of like studio 60 on the sunset strip which is a show that i absolutely loved but it came out at a bad time because of like the writer strike and other stuff going Uh on and um it just got canceled like but it got canceled early enough that they could actually write an ending, but the ending had to be before the end of the first season. So oh. it's not even like a full season. I mean, it is, you know, the season is what yeah. you make it, but it's not like a traditional TV season. It's like close to it, but not quite there. And you can tell in like the last four or five episodes that they are basically like using two or three seasons worth of what they would have done with the plot in two or three episodes and it's just oh. it's ridiculously fast paced but it's like we're never going to get to tell this story we might as well just use all of this right now that's 
I, I've I remember that show. I never watched it, but uh, I'm I'm glad they actually got to an ending. I um, I liked it just because like I watch most Sorkin stuff. Like I really like Aaron yeah. Sorkin's writing. Um, my wife was one that like she loves his writing, and she started pointing out like, hey, all of these things that you like, they're all written by him. So I started paying attention uh, after that, and so he's probably one of my favorite screenwriters out there. Even though he does a lot of other stuff that's also not screenwriting. Um, yeah, but that was one where. It just got cut like way too early for my <laughs> what I would have wanted. Well, I included Babylon Five on this list for specifically that reason. Uh, J. Michael Straczynski set it up as a five season TV show. Like that was his pitch. That was what he wanted. He had a story to tell across five seasons. Um, at the end of season, near the end of season four, uh, they found out that they were not getting a season five. So they wrapped everything up within that. Like they rushed the end of season four and. And uh, basically put that entire season into like the last quarter of the the season four. Uh, so they wrapped everything like it got to where the end point of the story that he wanted to tell with the War of the Shadows was over. And then the ratings were fine and the network was like, hey, you get your fifth season after all. And so there is a fifth season of Babylon 5 that is good, but... I like it, but there are so many things that were rushed that shouldn't have been that that they they put together just to get to that very end. That's actually what happened with Fringe too. They were pushing two seasons into season five. Uh, they well three seasons technically. They needed to get to season seven, and they only got to season five. So they put five, six, and seven in one, and it made it feel really, really pushed up like that. The same way that uh, Studio Sixty did. It's like those are really disappointing when that happens because you can tell. Xeno Gears is like that as a game. Uh, I mean, they uh, the the second disc of it is super rushed because they ran out of money and Square made them put it out. Like if they ever did a remake of a game, they should do it because they actually literally never finished it right. Yeah, it, I've read uh, about that one. That's an interesting one. It is. I mean, and as a teenager playing it, I didn't notice. But if I went back and I once I get to that point, I'm totally going to notice as an adult who's been trained in this kind of narrative structure. Well, and you even had in here, like, what about game endings? Because they can have multiple endings, you know, like there's not always a canon ending. Like this is the way it ends. It can very much depend on like how you played the game and what choices you made and all of that kind of thing. You know, for me, it's always like, what was my ending? That's the one that counts the most to me, unless right. I'm disappointed in it. If I'm disappointed in it, I am not ashamed of like going out and finding a better ending that someone else was able to get. I'm like, there's the canonical ending right there. Like, I'm going to choose that that's my ending from now on. But in something like, uh, especially in RPG, you know, a lot of the time, like Mass Effect, like that was my ending because like all my choices yep. led up to it. Like that was the ending that mattered to me. And any subsequent playthrough, no matter what, I will never like see a second playthrough as an ending that could be the canon. It's always the first time that I played it. Like that's what's locked into my head forever, which is interesting because you can get wildly different outcomes and it's the first one that always like leaves an impression with me. It is for me too. Game endings are one of those where anything else is a is just icing on the cake. It's just extra content for me. Even if it's something where you don't get the entire story until you do X, Y, and Z, you're beat it on a harder difficulty, it doesn't matter to me. It's like when I beat the game, my choices indicated what ending I got. And so that's the one that matters to me. And uh, kind of like uh, Bioshock, where when you whether you like kill the little sisters or or save them, you get a different ending. I don't care, you know, which one is technically better. I killed them and sucked out their juice and used it to power myself. So that was the ending I got. That's the ending of that game. Yeah, totally. Well, and like that's one of those places where like you could headcanon it, which you also have mentioned right. in here. Like, do you headcanon things that you don't like? I think I've maybe done that a few times. If it's like, you know, I it's usually um, I won't go against the choices that I've made, but it's more about like if I did all the things and I got like the quote unquote good ending, 
but there's like a special ending if you 100% do absolutely everything or you get right. 110% of the game I usually won't go out of my way like I don't have that kind of nope. time I will look it up online and then be like yep I'm tacking that on mentally as like headcanon part of my ending yeah I get that special ending too I just don't want to grind for hundreds of hours to get there yeah exactly that's actually what happened with Xenoblade Chronicles for me like I got to the end I knew like I was on the final boss and it, it kept beating me and I realized that it was going to take about another two or three hours of grinding just to get to the point where I could beat it and just see the ending. And I was like, I'm going to go on YouTube. I was like, I would, that's fine. I've beaten this game. I know how to beat it. I've done everything that I can. I don't want to spend another three hours just mindlessly killing things when I can look it up on YouTube. <laughs> totally. Um, and like Jennifer, though, like we don't like head cannoning things. I know there are a lot of people who, especially on Tumblr and in different fandoms, uh, head cannon is just this really fun thing they get into. And it brings up a lot of discussions and, and it's a great, great thing for some communities. And Jennifer and I don't really get into that. But the one thing that I think it's really funny that she head cannons are the new seasons of the X-Files that uh, she hate. Well, she loves them. Don't get me wrong. Let me let me let me rephrase this. She thinks that the new seasons of the x-files are dumb and quote they're just fun extra stuff that we got they're not real they're not that's not x-files that's just Mulder and scully be doing silly things it, it's that's it's that kind of thing where it's like she has her story that she grew up with and now there are these extra seasons that are changing it and that's not her story it's uh her story is within those first 10 seasons that's funny um, well hey if it works for her though like and that's i mean that's what headcanon is all about it's like if it works for yeah. you and it makes you happy it's not really affecting anybody else that's fine it's like people in the star wars movies it's like when the prequels came out everyone was like this is going to ruin star wars and it's like nah first three exist and they haven't been changed those are your star wars movies and now with the new ones they're like this is ruining star wars the last jedi is ruining star wars that changed that ruined luke skywalker i'm sorry if people if you believe that but it didn't and it's like nothing that luke did in any of the other movies changed everything is literally exactly the same as it was the last jedi changed nothing and so if you want to headcanon that out that's great do that but one, just because it's there doesn't mean that it has to ruin the narrative that you 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 cherish. Where that's something that I took a film and adaptation to film and TV adaptation class and that actually really solidified it in there to me. It's like even if there's a bad adaptation of a of a work, I can still go back and watch the original one and it wasn't ruined by that. It was still there exactly like I love it. And so that that's where I really feel about like head cannon too, where there's not a lot of stuff I do that with, but when it is, it's like, yeah. That's not what I'm going to watch. I'm never going to watch that again, so it doesn't count. Yeah, totally. Um, I know we also kind of want to talk about like spoilers and do they ruin things and how does it intersect with endings? But honestly, I think that might be its own topic. We might save that for another day. I think it might day. be. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, with that then, maybe we'll even pick this up next episode and talk about spoilers and kind of keep this conversation going because this was, we thought this was going to be a short episode and it ended up being normal if not a little bit longer for the main topic which is always which awesome. surprises me yeah, yeah it's awesome cool so we'll break here for uh geek your offer of the week where we have patreon as normal all right guys i'm gonna ask you a big favor i'm gonna need you to go to patreon.com slash geek to geek cast and i'm gonna need you to go on the little right hand of the screen and scroll down until you see where it says become an executive producer and i need you to click that button and then go and adjust your pledge because you can become the executive producer of the geek geek to geek podcast if you want just by going to patreon.com slash geek to geek cast or you don't have to do that you can do whatever else you want but that would be awesome too <laughs> i didn't know that was actually a thing that's pretty awesome um it is it's on there yeah so uh, around the network this week uh we are still a little bit time shifted but i know that basically everybody had an Endgame episode so if you haven't listened to those and you have watched <laughs> Endgame, geek to Dude had one tea time with katie and chelsea had one uh and sometimes rob was about that that was like his only episode that's come out under that new banner so far um and then outside but it's still of, the same feed as the comic box so if you is. were subscribed it will be in your feed now yep and then of course capsule j streaming tuesdays from 8 
to 11 p.m. Eastern, and sometimes on Thursdays and weekends. Troy Doyle streams on Thursdays, sometimes and sometimes randomly after dinner. And then uh, you also have the Geekery for this week. Yes, the Geekery is our catch-all uh, original content blog that we have for the network, and on it right now, the two original columns are Dragon Quest Austin, or really Austin's Dragon Quest Quest, where he's playing through all of the Dragon Quest games, and he is talking about Dragon Quest Four, Chapter 3 this week, and the 13th story is talking about the low-key excellence of Edu gaming where he's edu gaming uh where you talk about educational games and how great they can be so uh i, I just love love the stuff that they're doing right now so you can go there at geek geekmedia.com slash geekery sweet with that it's probably time for our weekly geekery where we talked about what we're geeking out about this week what have you been up to okay so i finally bought final fantasy 12 on the switch and started playing it oh like wow other people, how is it people People wouldn't shut up about it, and finally I was just like, you know what? It's cheaper on Amazon right now. I've I've heard too many good things about it, and so I started playing it, and I bought it, and it came in on Friday. So I've been playing it this weekend. I'm probably eight hours into it now, maybe, and uh, it was really funny this weekend. So I hate the beginning of this game. Like, I hate it. Like, I'm at the point now where I recognize the quality of the game, see how good it is, and really am going to push through to the end because I love the story so far. But the beginning of this game sucks. And it's as bad as it was in 2006 when it was brand new, when I played it on the PS2, when I started again on the PS2, when I started again after that on the PS2. Do not like the beginning of this game. It is simply not fun. Um, it the combat is awkward. You the the you until you open gambits up and can start uh, changing them, which is which is an inordinately long amount of time before you get to be able to adjust that. It's just they they started out too slow, but it's an excellent game. I really really like the game and. So this weekend when I'm playing this, uh, I'm texting Austin because he he has been pushing me to play uh, Final Fantasy XII more than anybody, more than you, more than all of the people on Twitter. It's like all the time, it's like, dude, you need to play twelve, And I'm like, oh, it's so bad. And so he finally convinced me to do this. And I'm not sure if I've mentioned it in the past or if people know about it, but our relationship dynamic is him raging about something and me doing my best to find the upside and the positive thing to keep uh, to keep him going until he finds that goodness or to work through that particular issue and this time it was flipped on its head where i'm just texting him rage there's nothing but rage on how much this game sucks and how how stupid things are and why they're doing it this way and i just don't understand why anyone would make these decisions this is terrible and uh, he just he pointed out he was like you know, our entire relationship is different. I'm calming you down from nerd raging right now. I'm like, yeah, I know this is bad, and uh, eventually it turned out not to be bad. Um, the there are the only two things that I'm really, I don't even want to say irritated about uh, in the game are I actually would rather have the old license board. I liked it better than this new one with the individual classes. I don't like being locked into a class. I want to be able to go just buy whatever license I want and give all of my people whatever they need. Uh, yeah, it feels I mean, really limiting right now. It's nice to give everybody swords and shields and way too much magic all at the same time. That's what I always did when I yeah. replayed it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like I want to be able to give people holy and I want to be able to. It, it's just this is very limiting in the scope of the way the game was made. And so I don't particularly like that. And the other thing is simply I don't like the camera. It's annoying uh, when you're zooming in. Like the speed up is is awesome and amazing, but man, when you're going at, at uh, times two or times four speed and using the uh, right stick to control the camera, it gets some wacky camera angles and you can't see what's going on sometimes. Uh, yeah, twelve other than that, is like, twelve is one where you know I've played them all and a lot of them I've played multiple times. Um, I think twelve is the only one that I still feel very mixed on, and it kind of depends on what mood you catch me in because like i can defend that game as being good and i can also tear that game apart as being horrible and right most of them like i've kind of landed somewhere with a final fantasy where i think it's either good or bad like mostly one way or another or but i know how i feel about it and i understand all the arguments around it but like i have a very solidified opinion about how i feel um oh yeah i don't feel like that about 12 12 is one that's like it's very much like what mood you catch me in. And I'm like, oh yeah, I hate that game. I never want to play it again. 
or it's like, oh yeah, that was pretty good. I should probably play that again. Like I will flip flop on 12 so much, which probably means that it deserves another replay from me. Um, but you could say almost anything about it and I would probably agree with it if you catch me at the right time. Now I would suggest playing it on the Switch over anything else, which is I know the only thing you would play it on at this point. But the reason being that they have made apparently one quality of life change that changes everything where you can actually like go in and change your class now. That apparently in the other remakes like once you picked whatever class it was you couldn't go back and like change so if you picked Vaughn to be a knight you couldn't go back and then change him to be a thief or a white mage um you can now so you can just go to to a little moogle and tell him you want to change uh change boards and he's like all right here you go and you can just change it and you can do that for all of your characters and it's great that's pretty Uh, sweet so that's that that's actually really helpful uh to to fix that stifling limitation from the from moving away from the old license board but i do like the game like the the takeaway is that i actually like it now and i'm going to play it um i have been playing probably more dragon quest 9 this week than i have uh this weekend i guess this week and weekend than i have on uh the final fantasy 12 because there's something about this game it being really cartoony and and just uh just a ds good like really good well-written dragon quest game that uh that's just fun it's just i've had more fun playing it than anything else uh this week because i hit a point where i opened up the job system and i'm playing around with it but it's one where it felt comfortable this week where final fantasy 12 was very tense and i'm learning and i'm i'm angry at things and i'm just like now my switch is dead i'm gonna charge it i would pick up nine and be like oh or dragon quest nine and i'd be like oh this is great this is fun i'm gonna run around and do this um probably my favorite thing about it is that you get to a like the second main city it doesn't take terribly long to get there and you can choose how many people you want in your party to continue the game with so you can actually play the entire game because it was a a precursor a test for dragon quest 10 um that uh, you can choose if you just want to play this game solo because there was multiplayer in it. So you didn't have a set party that you were adventuring with. You were just one character. That's who fought, That's who the story is about, this one character. And so you get NPCs that you can uh, add to your party. You get to pick their classes like you do in Final Fantasy 1, and you get to decide what they look like. So you get to customize up to like six or seven different characters that you can mix in and out of your party. And you can have two three or four people one two three or four people in your party at any time so you can name them and these are just other characters so i have a care i have a party full of characters i made going adventuring together that look like i want them to and are the classes that i want them to be it's like this this wonderful feeling that you got from old rpg games that you don't really get in modern ones and it's like it's just fun because of that whenever i see these characters fighting it's like oh yeah lesser the priest he's gonna stab something with a spear and it's like it's just fun and it's really hard to describe why but i like it better this way than having characters with their unique personalities i think which is totally not what i thought would happen that's interesting. I don't think I would like it anywhere near as much as you do, but I'm glad that you like it. Yeah, and I, I, I'm 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 a huge fan, and uh, like I said before, I think I like Dragon Quest better than Final Fantasy right now, and uh, I think that they're just consistently higher quality. I think is the thing on it, um, which I know someone will fight me for when this goes live. Um, could be you. And um, <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I tickled myself. Um, I also started the Eye of the World, the first Wheel of Time book you and i were talking about that just a little bit uh last week or it might have been the week before i don't remember since we recorded out of order and um i've been listening to it while i've been out running and this book is tolkien like he hits so many of the same beats that fellowship of the ring does in this first one that it's absurd how similar they are in that respect it's definitely influenced by tolkien because he kind of took the structure from it at least in this first one but i like it a lot man that's good i know you were very apprehensive about if you'd like it or not yeah and the it's the audiobook the reading it like this is the same as it was before. It's like, man, this is this is some heavy, thick, dense fantasy. It's like it's not that it's hard. 
It's just heavy, thick, dense fantasy. But listening to it, listening to the audiobook, really does lighten it, where there are the character voices and the, uh, the, the just pacing of the narrator makes it so much more bearable and so much more interesting. It's like I care far more. I just stopped reading it all entirely. Like, I'm just done with the uh, Kindle version of it. That was 10 bucks that I got just that I, I spent just to uh, learn this lesson where it uh, I'm not going to uh, do that anymore. It uh, by far better listening to it. And until the re- end of the series or whenever I decide to give up on it, it's going to be straight audio because the production is good. The actors are or the uh, voice actors are great. And I'm um, just I enjoy it. Like they actually make me care about the story and interested in the world. Like it hit the point where maybe two days ago I got interested in the backstory of the world. And that is the kind of thing that will keep me going because I love world building. And he finally hit on a couple of things that I'm like, oh, that's different. And I want to know what's going on. So, so way better than I thought it was going to be at first. Good. That's awesome. I mean, I read a couple books this week too for my weekly geekery, but none of them were like, nearly as interesting as your insights into the eye of the world so we'll see but i'm so i read uh boss fight books shovel knight that was like next on my list after uh katamari damasi and it is so much better than that book even though the structure (laughs) is similar like i know how i said i was kind of let down by um you know katamari's just look at the behind the scenes of the game but i think a lot of that was because it was like told to the reader and not like done through actual interviews because shovel knight is like tons and tons of first-hand accounts from all of the people who made the game because it's an indie game and they have that kind of access to these people so yeah and i love stuff like that like that is i love interviews with indie developers like i don't know what it is but that sounds so cool and that's what this entire book was it was really really good so it's these really cool behind the scenes like look at it and It's all personal. Well, it's not all, but it's almost all personal interviews from that entire dev team. Um, And the game is just so much more impressive to me now because I know what they went through to get it done and like all of the effort that has been put into that game and the challenges they faced and stuff like that. So if anything, it increased my appreciation for Shovel Knight because I already like that game a ton, but I like it even more now, which is sweet. And then so was this part of the Humble Bundle? that came with it uh or was this one of the ones that came in the humble bundle because i ended up buying that a while back and just haven't looked through which ones are there i just kind of bought it because it was a giant bundle of of boss fight books and i like them and so i didn't know if this was one of those or if you had just grabbed it off amazon no i just got it on amazon i don't i don't know it might have been in that bundle i don't usually buy humble bundle books so i'm not sure but I will look right now and let you know. Yeah, you can find out. But yeah, Boss Fight Books, Shovel Knight, um, I recommend it if you liked Shovel Knight and you played it. It was a really good book. And then I read the War of the Spark Ravnica novel, which I'm just into magic, right? I'm trying like all of the different yep. Magic the Gathering things. And it's one where it's kind of weird. It's a very messy book because there are so mm. many characters and it's the culmination of this story that they've been playing out for like a decade or something like that. And... Uh, it's it's not a great intro book to get into this story or into this setting um but i was kind of okay with it because i've been playing with these cards pretty much every night for the last like two or three weeks so i've seen all this art and i've seen all of the names of the cards and i'm pretty familiar with all of them and this kind of tied all of that together for me into a cohesive story like i kind of knew the outlines of the story of what was happening in this expansion but this explicitly laid it out but the thing is if i hadn't been playing with those cards for the last two or three weeks there is no way i would have had any idea what was going on in this book because it is just all over the place there's like something like 100 or 120 different like named actual npc like characters not npcs but just characters that are actually characters which is way too many for a book and it's one where i probably wouldn't recommend it but i (laughs) liked it like i like understanding the story even though it wasn't a good book the story itself was fine and it was interesting and i still think the story is good because i'm into that right now do you know what i mean i'm just landing in this really Uh weird spot with it no i did that with world of warcraft books that that any of those that i ended up reading i cannot say that they were good books and i can't say for anybody that they should just go out and read it 
but because I was into that medium or into that property so much that I was like, yeah, I liked that book. I liked Arthas a lot whenever I read it. It was not uh, something I would say, go, oh, y'all need to go out and read that. But it was, it was, I liked it. Yeah, probably don't read War of the Spark, but I liked it. I liked it enough. I'm glad that I read it. I can say that for sure, 100%. And then I and also... And yes, I did look up and I did look up the boss fight books. And yes, Shovel Knight is in the Humble Bundle. So if anybody out there uh, grabbed that when it happened, you have that book. So uh, you and I should both go read it. Cool. Um, I also played a bunch of Magic the Gathering Arena because that's what I've been playing lately. Um, War of the Spark Sealed is still like one of my favorite things that I've done probably this entire year as far as like playing games. And that's awesome. I had this awesome run with a Boar God card that I tried to build a deck around in Sealed. It's called Ilharg the Raise Boar. And uh, my son was sitting there while I was playing it, and he saw that. He's like, oh, that's so cool. And I was like, well, let's just build a whole sealed run around it. <laughs> and I got my money back on that run because I got six wins. So it ended up being multiple hours of fun. And, like, the more wins you get, um, the more gems you get back. And it costs you, like, 2,000 gems to buy in. And I think I got mm -hmm. to the level where I either got 2,000 or 2,200 back. So I might have actually made a little bit on it. Um, so I got... Yeah, I got all of these packs. I got like six packs in the end. No, it's like nine or ten free packs because I made my money back. Plus, I got multiple hours of fun out of it. So right. that was amazing. So like, you can do it again. You've got the yeah. gems that back to be able to spend it on another one if you want to. Yes, exactly. So that was a ton of fun, and I loved it, and I want to do that. I want to do another sealed run, and I, I'm going to keep trying draft, but I'm just like, the more I try draft and sealed, the more I'm drawn towards sealed. So we'll see, but either way, I'm still playing it, and I'm having a lot of fun. And then I'm so, so happy about that. Yeah, I love it. And the other thing with Magic the Gathering is... I was thinking about like, I try not to come back with the same thing every week, you know, if I've been playing a game for as long as I have, which isn't typical of me, but I was thinking about it this week and I was like, what else can I even talk about? Like I've been talking about a ton recently. Um, and it was daily quests. Like I was keeping an eye on daily quests this week. Cause you know, I'm playing it every day. I'm like getting the daily quest done. And I was like, what is it about these that's working for me where Hearthstone was always frustrating. And the thing with magic, the gathering uh, daily quest is that they are never about winning they're always about right. playing the game and that is something that i think i it maybe even on this podcast before explicitly mm -hmm. asked for about hearthstone is like i want to be encouraged to play the game i don't want to have to win to get things and right that was my problem with hearthstone and magic gathering seems to have fixed it but like they totally fixed it it's exactly what i want it to be you know it's not always like you know, if I'm playing, like I have a mono black deck that I'm playing a ton right now that I really like, and then I have a, a dual deck that's like white red that's really good that I'm playing a lot. Sometimes it'll come up and it's like the daily quest is play 20 green spells. I'm like, oh, I got to go into one of my green decks, right? It's not always like perfect for like what I've been playing the most of, but it'll push me into different ways of playing the game. And I know that I don't have to win to get those rewards. Like I'm not limited right. by that. All I have to do is play. And it might be playing one game. It might be playing two or three. But if I sit down for like half an hour, I can probably finish whatever the daily quest is. Whereas there were times with Hearthstone where it's like win twice as a road. And I just couldn't do it. I could play for like hours and I would just fail and never get yep. it. And I would get frustrated and I would give up and never want to go back. That was my big frustration too. Like that was always just so obnoxious whenever you just, you tried to get it. Like that was what was so bad about it is like you were actively working on this quest and could not do it. Yeah, it was, I don't know. That was so frustrating. So magic does not do that. And I love it for that. It's amazing. And it's not to say that they don't care about wins because they also have weekly quests for wins, mm -hmm. but those will get you packs. And the thing is, You'll just kind of like if you go in and you do the daily quest, which is what I'm usually doing, right? I'll jump in, I'll play a bunch to like get the gold for the day, get the daily quest, and I'll usually end up winning kind of randomly sometimes in there. And the thing is, if you do that, you'll end up basically getting all of the weekly wins anyway. So I never yeah. have to go out of my way to be like, oh, I need to grind out a bunch of wins to get this thing for the day because it's not on a daily schedule. It's on a weekly schedule. And something about that changes the stress level and makes it so much more acceptable. And like, I'm just totally fine with it. It does where I look at it and it resets and I'm like, oh, I got to win 15 times. It's a good thing that means like twice a day or something where it's like it's not a big deal. Like just depending on you don't have to feel like you're not going to get it because a couple of play sessions, you could potentially get it with the games being as quick as they are and people being as quick to concede as they are. 
Yeah, and there are times where like I will, you know, most nights I'll try to play like a little bit, like 20, maybe 30 minutes. And then Mm -hmm. there are days or maybe on the weekend or whatever weekend morning if my family's not up yet where I can play for a few hours just back to back. So what happens is like, most days I'm finishing the daily quest and then there will be one or two sessions throughout the week where I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to dig in and just play for a while just for the fun of playing. And that's usually when I'll start getting those like win, um, the weekly quests for the winning enough. Yeah. 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 That's what happens to me whenever I'm going through that. It's like, I'll keep magic up some days, like on one monitor where I'm not even necessarily actively playing it or anything. I'm working and writing and doing SEO research and all of this. And then I'm like, okay, I can't do that. And I go into magic magic and i'm just like i'm gonna play this white and blue deck or something and i get a win or two and then that's my break and i go back to work and that kind of thing adds up to where sometimes i'm like oh i get a pack that's awesome and uh, it's just a a nice surprise the same way with the daily quest it's like oh i must have killed 20 creatures and uh it's that those are very fulfilling where i've not even approached magic with the oh i have to get this done today like I did with Hearthstone. Yeah, so I'm still loving it. Uh, I don't think it's surprising anyone at this point, but I'm still playing it. I'm playing it a lot, and it's it's a really good game. Um, and I do think that uh, Ninja Boy on... Uh on Slack, uh, I think it was him who posted in the Geek to Geek Cast channel that uh, that Magic: The Gathering has been determined by uh, by the MIT Technology Review. Is where he posted this link. Um, that's the headline is Magic the Gathering is officially the world's most complex game. A new proof uh, with important implications for game theory shows that no algorithm can possibly determine the winner. And that's in the the Geek to Geek uh, cast Slack channel. Like it's you are literally playing the world's most officially complex game. Well, it's a lot of fun. And so like, that's like, the important that's really part. cool. Like I thought that was really really awesome. Just the idea of it with. Uh, with having that, uh, like you were talking about the possibility space before being so large and so intimidating that even computers can't figure it out. <laughs> cool. Um, that's probably about it for this week. You guys can write to us with comments, suggestions, or feedback. Our email address is geek to geekcast at gmail.com or reach us on Twitter at geek to geekcast We also have longer discussion threads on our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash geek to geekcast And we have great discussions as well on Slack and Discord. And you can go to geek2geekmedia.com and there are invite links in the menu. And you can hang out with all of us and then get to know all of the team and uh, check out their content. I blog at agreenmushroom.com and you can find me at GRN Mushroom. That's Green Mushroom without the E's on Twitter. And I'm on Twitter as at Professor Beach. That's Beach with two E's. And I blog sometimes at places <laughs> we've been void beach with your geek to geek podcast that'll do it for this week see you next week geeks bye geeks it's the end Hi everyone, I'm Katie. And I'm Chelsea, and we are the hosts of Tea Time with Katie and Chelsea. We are two best friends who love pop culture and talking about pretty much whatever we want. Katie! Yes? Stop thinking about Zac Efron and tell our future listeners what some of our latest episodes have been about. Well, we've talked about Zac Efron. No, get it together, Katie. Fine. We've talked about fan fiction, classical literature adaptations, favorite TV couples, and so much more. So grab your cup of tea or whatever your drink of choice is and download our podcast today. Hi, my name is Joe Hogan, and I'm a geek. And if you're currently listening to this, there's a good chance you're a geek too. So check out my podcast, Geektitude. Each week, I talk with somebody about their geek aptitude. Sometimes I talk to people in a geeky profession. Sometimes it's someone doing something really cool with their geekiness. Often it's another geeky podcaster. But it's always someone who wants to share their inner geek. So join me each week as we come together to geek out about all the geeky stuff we love. And remember, this week, keep it geek. Hello, friends. This is Troidal Power inviting you to join me over on Twitch most weeknights sometime after dinner. Video games have always been a social hobby for me, with friends and family crammed together on a couch chatting away while someone holds the controller. And thanks to the power of the internet, I've got my own virtual couch over on Twitch where you can kick back and goof off while I play games. Find me on Twitch by searching Troidal Power, that's T-R-O-Y-T-L-E Power, to snag a spot on the couch.